Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Land Down Under Hangouts uh, January. This month, we're actually doing something a little bit different. We're reading our Secret Santa books from December last year. So everyone read whatever they received, and we're going to be giving a sort of overview of what we thought, whether we recommend them. Maybe we finished them, maybe we haven't. I don't know if any of the others have. Um, shall we start off with Elizabeth? Because I know that she has to leave us sooner rather than later. Thank you. Um, so I received The Left-Handed Booksellers of London by Garth Nix. Now this is, hmm, it is set in a, the late 1980s in London in a kind of an alternate version. It's a bit like, hmm, James Bond with like fairy elves. Um, so uh, a girl goes to London to, um, uh, she's going to art school, um, but she's come a bit early to investigate the identity of her father, who she never really knew. Um, her mum is a bit of a space cadet and never really kind of said much about, about her dad. So she's gone to kind of to find out what she can and gets caught up in like this magical uh, world that's going on. Um, so the secret agents are, uh, are the booksellers in a way. So like the left-handed booksellers are like the, um, the action heroes, basically the, the fighters, um, those sort. The right-handed booksellers are like the academics, the one who did, ones who do the research. Um, and uh, because, you know, um, monster hunting and whatnot doesn't make a lot of money, they also run bookshops. So yeah, it was fast paced. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was particularly deep, but if you're looking for a fun read, it's a good one. Um, it does kind of have a bit of a YA vibe to it, um, which Garth Nix tends to get kind of pigeonholed into, um, even though I don't think that this is really like what he intended for this book. Um, and maybe it was meant to be a bit more new adultish, but I'm not sure he pulls it off quite well enough. Um, and there's a bit of a, like, there's a bit of a romance subplot there that mm, isn't super convincing and could have probably just been taken out without hurting anything. But uh, on the whole, it was a diet. Do you think he does? He gets the. He's trying not to do YA, but he can't help himself and have that vibe. Yeah, maybe. Look, I I have one of his other recent uh, releases, which is Angel Mage. Um, I've not read it yet, um, and that I think too was an attempt to kind of get away from the YA a bit. So it's hard to say how successful he was in that one but mm. I will get back to you on it. Um, but he, yeah, he has been writing YA for a while, um, so it could be that. I know he tends to write um, a bit more adult stuff with his short stories, but uh, they tend to get a lot less sort of uh, attention than his, than his novels do. He's a lot well, uh, less well-known for those. Fair enough. Oh, action adventure booksellers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a soft spot for Garth Nix. He's a he's actually a local boy before he um, went and moved to Sydney, um, and he always makes a point of stopping in here on his book tours, which is um, unusual because we don't get um, a lot of big names through. But uh, so yeah, have a real fondness for him, and I do like his work. Um, yeah, as I said, not particularly deep this one, but still a lot of fun. And I think, I'm not sure whether it's supposed to be the first in a series. Like I wouldn't mind if it was. Um, on the other hand, it's also kind of, leave, it kind of ends in a, a satisfying spot. So that is fine. It could stand alone without any trouble. I do like a standalone. <laughs> hmm. Rare, rarer these days, I guess. <laughs> So yeah, next. I can go next. Mm. Unless you had something else to add, Elizabeth. Or no, no. Questions? If there are any questions, then I'm happy to take those. But otherwise, I'm done. What did you end up writing it? Uh, I'd probably give it a three, uh, maybe three and a half, but probably not more than that. 
I got given the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. And it is not at all what I was expecting, but is also so far I'm about halfway-ish. Um, but is also just amazingly fantastic. Um, very, very Southern. So it's set in the 1980s. Um, what about 1980s? Elizabeth Deadhurst was 1980s oh, yeah. as well. Um, so it's set in the 1980s and the main character, Patricia Campbell, is like very typical southern 1980s housewife, um, lives in a upper middle class white neighbourhood, um, her husband's a doctor, um, two kids, you know, they do soccer camp and all the typical very, you know, middle class families type, type of thing. And... Um, and she ends up joining a book club and at first it seems like they're just in their book club for gossipy things but they end up um, with a fascination for true crime novels and one day um, she gets attacked by an elderly neighbor and her the neighbor's Grand nephew has just moved in with her and um, he comes over. No, she goes to his house to make sure that the woman who attacked her was okay, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because she attacked her and um, ends up getting all wrapped up in the grand nephew's um, affairs. He's just moved to town and it's all very peculiar. You know, he doesn't have ID and he doesn't have a bank account. Um, and she ends up helping him sort all those things and pass the house over to him and everything. Um, and she can't sort of say no to him. Um, anyway, he's quite, it's not a particularly deep, mysterious book. He's obviously the vampire. And um, she ends up discovering all these little things about him but everyone else in the neighborhood thinks she's crazy because vampires aren't real and she reads all these true crime novels so of course she's just making mountains out of molehills and so one night she actually catches him in the act um and it's just really while it sounds sort of mundane to read about you know a housewife in the 1980s um it's just got this like beautiful charming nature to it just the way that she acts and talks and everything like I've been reading the whole every character in this book has a very southern accent in my head I can't not read it like that just because of the dialogue um the author's just done this really great job of capturing exactly what you expect them all to sound like and the way you expect them to interact with one another um and yeah like I said well it's not particularly deep um, it is really intriguing just watching everything unfold and seeing everyone's reactions to her being like, but no, something's going on. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really enjoying it so far and I can't wait to finish it. Oh, also, I know I showed you guys months ago when I got it, but I have to show you again because I just love it so much. The book without the dust jacket on it has the little library stamp down the bottom. That is adorable. And it just makes me so happy. Um, do you think that, okay, so we pointed out the similarities of like the 1980s with the, at both of our books. Do you get the sense that maybe they're trying to circumvent mobile phones and the internet? I hadn't thought of that. Like with these Definitely. modern books. Things that... I had sort of thought of it, it was more of a, you know, the whole Stranger Things nostalgia thing is happening because the people who were children in the 1980s are now of a particular age where they're consuming a lot of media. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, that's a really good point as well because one of the things that I just read, she drove out. Um, so there's some interesting racial themes through it as well. Um, he targets um, the lower class black families because no one will question if a black child goes missing. Um, which is a really interesting sort of thing to put in the book as well. Um, and she drives out to the black neighbourhood because she wants to warn them and help them with what's going on. 
and leaves a note for her husband about where she's gone at 10 o'clock at night. And so, yeah, I guess, you know, had they had mobile phones, she would have just texted him and been like, I'm going here rather than him having to come home and discover a note. Yeah, and also she would have like some way of calling for help in a hurry if she, if something had happened to her, um, which she obviously wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, they call the police and because they're in the black neighbourhood, the police take forever to arrive. Whereas if she had had a mobile phone and she had been the one making the phone call, they probably, it may have been treated differently. Mm. And no uh, ability to video like uh, yeah. proof or anything. It's an interesting question too, because, but I don't feel like, like in the previous decade, we weren't getting heaps of 70s based fiction. So I'm sort of like, I feel like it has more to do with the technology. Like there's enough technology um, to make it a bit more interesting, but not, like you said, mobile phones to make it easy to do certain things. Yes, but um, even like shows and stuff where they still have the technology of like mobile phones and stuff, people still run around stupidly and don't like just text a person or call a person <laughs> or email a person a question. Oh, she so goes like, through this whole situation and is like, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to die. Why am I still doing this? I need to leave. I'm definitely going to die. This is a stupid thing to do. Going to read about me in a book. I'm going to be dead. Why am I still doing this? And she keeps doing it anyway. So. <laughs> but like, there's like, I can't even remember what we were watching. There was some show we were like, you know what would fix all of these problems? Communication. You have mobile phones and emails and I can't even think of what it was, was that we were watching. But, like, seriously, like, all problems would have been solved with just basic communication. Wasn't it while we were watching Bridgerton? And that's not even a technology thing. That was just, just bloody talk to each other. No, this was um to all the boys. No. Number two. Are you sure? That was ages ago. Though. It was ages ago. Okay. But, like, there are things that are based in a timeline where people have mobile phones and Skype and all yeah. that sort of stuff. And the problem is that people don't communicate because it makes for good plot points. Like, mm. I feel yeah, like... Does it make for a good plot point, though? Or is it just make for a frustrating plot point where you're going, just have a conversation? That's pretty much... Yep. I just like I, I even know like with I haven't watched the second to all the boys but I know that in that one like one of the other boys rocks up I'm like who does that who doesn't get on social media and make contact before you rock up at someone's door like someone who not, thinks they're being romantic but is actually putting you out being romantic about showing up at someone's door no, <laughs> like not. Not unless you're like a well-established, already ready to go kind of thing, you know. <laughs> anyway, sorry. No, that's completely behind. But yeah, like, well, yes, I do feel like you're probably right in that some people are writing more real-worldy sort of novels based in a timeline where there is less technology because it's easier to have these, like, you know. She had to leave a note instead of just sending him a text message. Like, I also wonder if they picked the 1980s just because there is just a lot of nostalgia for the 80s compared to previous decades because pop culture became such a phenomenon in that decade. Yeah. Not to disintegrate decades prior, like obviously the 60s and 70s and in the 50s and beyond have their things, but the 80s is when, you know, media really exploded yeah it was there's a big change in terms of how media like it it has its own vibe yes but also it changed how big media was in everybody's lives yeah yeah kim would you like to go next all right so i'm reading the the history of mischief by rebecca higgy so uh, the main character is a girl called Jessie. She's nine years old and she, her parents have passed away in an accident. She's being raised by her 20-year-old sister. Um, and some things happen. There's lots, lots of going on that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> but um, some things happen. Their house gets broken into. And while 
Jesse and her sister are sitting on the floor of a, they've moved into their grandmother's house. They're sitting on the floor of the thing. They see a um, piece of the carpet's been pulled up and they they pull the carpet back and there's a little trap door. The gate key, this weird gate key opens up and they find a book called, um, called The History of Mischief. Um, and it says that it's a uh, trans, like a, a transcription of the real book which I'm assuming is a magical book um, of all these stories about these people who've called themselves a mischief, referred to themselves as a mischief. And so they start reading the book. The first story is um, uh, told by a, a slave of Alexander the Great's um, in um, Athens. And uh, it's between the stories between him and Diogenes. And so it's about him discovering when he meets Diogenes that he has these weird little powers. He gets these weird little magical powers that he can they call he calls mischief rather than magic because people can't see him do it. He can't they can't talk about he can't talk about the magic. He can't directly harm anyone. So it's things like, you know, he can light candles and slow down time and do all these little things that can't directly affect anyone. Um, he can't do anything if someone sees him do it. So they can only do like these little things, you know, move things with their mind, but not if someone's looking. Mm. Um, and so it's about, so the first story is about him and he scares Alexander away. Um, so it's sort of like is telling history from a different perspective. So he gets um, Alexander to leave uh, Athens and Diogenes passes away. And so it goes back to Jesse at school and some more about them and then they go home and they read the second story and the second story which is the one I've just finished is uh the actually told by another guy in can't remember Alexandria so it's based in the library of Alexandria and he finds this book like they confiscate all the books that come off the ships with people who land in Alexandria and they take them to the library and this guy takes one to old pup and old pup is actually the slave from the previous story and um this guy starts to get the the he sees old pup doing this magic that he shouldn't be able to see and he starts getting the powers and then he finds old pup and old pup pup's been murdered and then the library of alexandria she he ends up working out who it is um takes them the the guys want the soldiers want them to uh bring them back to the library of alexandria and this person sets the uh, library alight and burns it to the ground and so it's sort of telling a different history of that and then it goes back to jesse again so it's sort of like this they're reading this ongoing book that's like step by step how these people have gotten the mischief power so it's really interesting at the moment i was kind of disappointed when i looked at my watch and it was a uh, time to start the book club because I was really enjoying it and I had to stop. Well, I'm not the only one. Naomi went to pick up dinner by herself because I was lying on the bed reading and she was like, it's okay, you stay there and keep reading. Oh, thank you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> you should be able to do whatever you want on your birthday. You need to be careful it wasn't your birthday, I probably would have let you stay reading too. <laughs> Get those points anyway, Naomi. <laughs> It sounds yes, fun, I but think I think I would tell find... I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> I, it sounds good, except for I think I would find reading about the um, Library of Alexandria burning down rather traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> I was so sad when I hear about it. Like 451 for the first time when I was younger and being like, wait, what? What's happening? Like, it was really stressful. I can imagine. <laughs> so I'm going to go next. I'm reading this Savage Song by B.E. Schwab, or Victoria Schwab, sorry on this one. She uses both pen names. Um, it's about, it's like a post-apocalyptic kind of world. So there are humans and there are three types of demons, I suppose is the best way to describe them. So there's the Corsair which um, are kind of a lot like ghouls, like they're not super smart. They attack in packs. They 
live in the sewers and they like will just take the flesh from your bone kind of thing. Then there are the Malachi, which are kind of like somewhere, but they're a vampire-based kind of monster, but they're not not suave vampires. They're very they're a bit they're a bit more leaning more towards the first vampires from Buffy, like that sort of grungy, dirty, like vicious sort of vampire, but they still speak English and still have sort of what seems like a bit of a society. You don't really get a lot of a look in on those two. And then there is a, the third one is called the Sunai. Um, the Sunai, there are only three in existence in this world and they're created basically when a, a disaster happens. So if there's a mass murder or if there is, you know, giant bomb go off like all the despair and death that happens in that moment causes the creation of a sunai um so the sunai can basically they they can take the soul from people by by the use of music all three of the sunai in the main story so the main one of the main characters august is the youngest of the sunai and he uses a violin to sort of um so they use their song to draw out a person's soul um and he along with his sister who only uses her voice and the older brother which seems to be able to use anything i'm just i'm sort of two thirds of the way through um, and they're just starting to describe why, or like, you know, why Pete, why there are certain instruments. Like, so August is sort of just starting to explain to the other main characters, Kate, who is the daughter of the, like, he's the mafia boss of the human world. Like, he basically controls the protection of humans in the city from the monsters, basically. So he controls, he's not the mayor, which is why I more describe him as a mafia boss because he is, he's more underworldy, but he does still have a lot of power in the real world. Um, and basically what's been going on is August is sent to school and is starting to sort of, and is sent to basically get to know Kate because at the moment, they have um, the North City and the South City have a treaty to sort of not fight. The South City are where the three Sunai children live with sort of a bunch of humans and sort of they try to protect them from the other monsters. And then the North City is basically all humans and the Haka family basically tries to control or he thinks he has control over the Corsai and the Malachi, but that seems to be falling apart. And sort of the story is August and Kate getting to know one another and kind of learning about what's been actually going on on both sides of the city, on both sides, and sort of what is causing this to fall apart. I'm actually really, really enjoying it. I can't wait to finish it. I'm a little bit worried about reading the second book because I read a bunch of reviews on the second book and I'm kind of worried that it's going to be real bad. <laughs> so I'm hoping that I'll get to the end of this book and it'll give me a good ending and then I won't feel bad if I decide not to read the second book. Just because some of the, some of the um, reviews of people that I've actually read reviews of before and agreed with their opinion, um, it kind of gave the view of like the story in the second book doesn't isn't really an expansion on the first but it kind of just goes off on its own tangent it doesn't really like it brings in a bunch of new characters but doesn't really follow the characters we have been following yeah so we'll sounds see. like it's a little more urban fantasy fantasy style um well I, the reason i said post-apocalyptic was because um the very start of the book is describing how the last Sunai child was born, which is when the treaty came into place. Right. Basically, there's like a lockdown every, like you have to be in your home before sundown. You have to wear 
um, basically like a talisman made of iron that's owned that you're given by the Haka um, com um, Haka company that basically mm. says that you're under their protection. So if any of the monsters harm you, they get hunted down and killed, um, which is why I sort of said more. But yeah, it is urban fantasy as well. But Me both. it does have a bit of a vibe of post-apocalyptic just because it is very like, you know, everything locks down. You only have one form of, you know, every, like you, there's no, like everything's paid for with cash. There are cameras everywhere. That, like if you're anywhere in the north side of the city, the Harker Foundation will find you, basically. It's but all what very- was the apocalypse then? Did I miss that? Um, so it seems like the apocalypse was whatever caused August to be born. It sounds like right. some sort of either, like it sounds like some sort of like ending of some war. Like it hasn't really gone into a lot of it because obviously it's being told by August's point of view. And for yeah. him, that was the day he was born. So he doesn't really go back to it. Mm. But that's sort of why, like, I mean, it could be wrong. I could, it could have just been like, it could have just been the vibe that it was giving me because it doesn't really say a lot before what happened at the start of the treaty, basically. Like yeah. you don't get a lot of free world sort of stuff before the treaty. So, but yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I'm the way it's going, I'm probably going to give it three and a half to four. We'll see how it finishes. Um, yeah, I love Victoria Schwab. I enjoy a lot of her books. I would say that this is more YA to new adult sort of age range. Um, what is the difference between her Victoria Schwab name and her Victoria uh, Schwab? Why does she write? Victoria Schwab is her... YA, her VE Schwab is more new adult to adult. Right. This is very much, it is YA because the characters are teenagers. They're mm -hmm. in high school, but yeah. it has a lot more, because it's a lot, like there's a lot of death and violence, which is why I would push it towards the very end of YA, possibly the start of new age, uh, new, sorry, new adult. But yes, her VE, VE Schwab is more her, adult fiction and Victoria Schwab is her YA. Yeah. Um, her VE Schwab often has like that dark shade of magic and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff, which often has like that, like, I mean, that one in particular has like a romance story. I don't think this is going to. Um, but yeah, her VE Schwab often has a lot more adult themes, just in general, a lot more violence, a lot more sort of what like it yeah it is just a lot more adult thing so yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry I'm leading this thing yes you are <laughs> uh, Mel would you like to go next sure okay so I'm reading um an audiobook which is called Embers of War by Gareth L Powell yep um, and I haven't read him before, never really don't know anything about him. Um, I just read the blurb and thought, that sounds really good. <laughs> um, so, uh, this is what the one I, I've started. So the reason I liked, I was drawn to this particular story is because one of the major characters is actually a ship, um, called Trouble Dog, <laughs> which I thought was fantastic. And, you know, found family stuff always gets me as well. So that's always a bonus too. So the crew of the Trouble Dog, I believe, is going to be a found family vibe. We'll see. Um, and uh, essentially, Trouble Dog was a warship um, that did some pretty serious uh, violence at the end of, I think it was at the end of the war. I'm not sure. I'm only about two hours into the audiobook, um, which is about a fifth. So I've got enough that I've got some sort of basic knowledge, but I'm not sure that I've got a full solid basic basic knowledge yet. Um, but yeah, so she was, I don't know if I actually say she or it. She, yeah, she, sorry, I'm looking at the blurb. Um, she was part of uh, the faction for the war and um, was instrumental in a particularly bad um, strike that happened during the war, which she feels guilty about because she's an AI that has been built using human and dog um, biology 
Um, she's actually got a bit of a conscience um, because she's not just purely programmed. Um, and so she resigned from um, service, which they couldn't stop her from doing. And she's now joined a new group who basically are, uh, they're a group that goes out and helps and rescues people. So she's um, sort of joined this as a way to atone for what she's um, done. And um, I'd be probably a lot more into it if I was getting a lot more of the ship. Right now, we seem to be getting an awful lot more of the humans <laughs> um, who are sort of like part of this intergalactic group. Um, and then there's alien races and things on those lines, but I haven't got enough of all of that to understand what's going on with, uh, on that side of things. Um, I kind of went in this thinking that it was going to be majority the ship, but so far I would say she's probably the fourth character in, out of all the characters who we've been following. And um, so I was kind of, I'm hoping that's gonna switch as we get further into the story, we'll see. Um, but yeah, so there are uh, just, done their first mission and they're off on to the, the, the big one that I think is actually really the story plot, plot point. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's one of those audio books that has multiple uh, readers, narrators, sorry, um, for the different perspectives, which as we know from experience can be good and can be bad, depending. So far, most of them are good, but there's one who I just can't stand listening to. And I'm just like, breathe through, it's okay, you'll get used to it, it's all right. And it's not the whole time at least. So <coughs> that's something. It's always one of the things I think is really hard about sampling audio books. You only ever get like usually one voice to sample. But anyway, um, so yeah, I'm enjoying it. I will probably not finish it very quickly because it requires me to do something at the same time, preferably driving. Um, but I'm, um, you know, I probably wouldn't recommend it for Karina because AI. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, it, <laughs> it depends, I suppose. You usually don't like robots and AIs and things. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I figure, you know, you managed to handle it for a long way to a small, small angry planet. So if this one works out well, you might be okay, depending on how the story goes. And on that note of giving warnings about things, I completely forgot just on the off chance that anyone does pick this up and want to read it. If you have a rat phobia, this book is not the book for you. There is a scene in it that I was like, like I read like this. Okay. <laughs> So I don't have a rat phobia, but that sounds like not something I want to read. <laughs> yeah. So if rats are not for you, this book is not for you. Like it's one scene, um, but it's a pretty heavy thing. Ooh. Saying that AI thing made me remember that I was like, oh yeah, I need to warn people that if that's something you're squeamish about, this is not for you. Good idea. I think just Liz left. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is it me? She's, she's playing with her phone. Oh, she's reading. Oh! <laughs> in the middle of Hangout! <laughs> you I'm made her sorry. talk about the book she's really enjoying. She can't help herself now. <laughs> she's not even reading her book. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading a book. Not your book that you're holding. Miss Liv, would you like to discuss your book? Yeah. I haven't finished mine either, but I have an excuse because it is a poem for every night of the year. So I'm up to page 15 because it's 15th of January. Um, but yeah, it's sort of like a mix of like classic modern poems. And it's been really nice because I don't really, really read a lot of poetry. And when I do, I read it through very fast. Uh, so it's nice to sort of like, you know, sit down and actually properly read it. Um, I've so far quite liked the poems. There's one in particular that makes no sense, but it's just hilarious. Uh, it's called the Loch Ness Monsters Song. And all it is is actually it might be just easy just to show you because I can't, I can't pronounce this. Uh, can you see that? Oh. It's like sneer <laughs> like that. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, Try and make me sound. Page two. 
Snail waffle, henna waffle, henna, henna, fell, flow. Get a bit of a look, get a kidding, and I don't know how to say that. <laughs> 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 what is this? But I was just like, this is my favorite so far because it just doesn't make any sense. And also, I like the Loch Ness monster. Um, but I can read you the one that is today because that one actually is coherent. So would you like me to read it out loud? Yes, yes please. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to read the background behind it, but because um, they do these little like background intros to the poems just to have an idea of what it's about and who the author is. So it's called Dream Variations by Langston Hughes, who I've never heard about. He, um, um, he did the fridge poem with the plums. Oh, because I think he's in relation to Martin Luther King as well. That's what it was telling Possibly, me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is in relation to that. Um, so I'll read it out. To fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, to whirl and to dance till the white day is done, then rest at cool evening beneath a tall tree while night comes on gently, dark like me. That is my dream. To fling my arms wide in the face of the sun, dance well, well, till the quick day is done, rest at pale evening, a tall slim tree, night coming tenderly, black like me. So yeah, it looks like it's um, in relation to I Have a Dream by Martin Luther King. So yeah, sounds good. Lovely. And now I've lost my bookmarks, so I'm gonna just use a movie voucher. Perfect. <laughs> oh no, I skipped a page. Well, it's a good thing if you know what the date is so you can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, that's the easy part. <laughs> so I nearly I'll... forgot to read it last night. Um, well, actually, I did forget to read it last time. So this morning I went, oh, I need to read it. So I read it this morning, the, um, the 14th of January one. So are you going to try and just read one every night? Like, is that your plan for the rest of the year? That's my plan. And even when I'm away from home and I don't have my book with me, I've already made the plan in my head to take photos of each of the pages that I'm going to miss so I can take it with me. Smart. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very. That's really cool. Yeah, I really like it. And it's so pretty. Look at this top. It is lovely. It is really yeah. pretty. And but the only problem like it, but is... very difficult to find. What was that? <laughs> I'm very glad you like it. It was really difficult to find a nice hardcover. Oh, oh I wonder who my secret Santa is. Mm -hmm. oh, that was me. I did it. <laughs> oh, one thing I didn't mention about my book, I reckon it was the, I, I think it might be G, either G or Jazz. It is by Fremantle Press and uh -huh. it's in Western Australia. That sounds like, <laughs> so a, like, that sounds like a G thing. It could be G or Jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I admit, I saw the cover and I thought that it was Mel because it was just so such a pretty cover. <laughs> like, it was definitely Mel. I mean, it could be anyone, but just because it's Fremantle Press and from West, uh, set in Western Australia, I'm like, it's probably G. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking it up. Yeah, it was G. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Busted. Uh, Elizabeth, I didn't even look at the package. Like I, it, it came up with just my my name on the front, and when I opened it, I didn't even look at the back of the package in case the address was on there. I like opened it up and pulled it out, and I went, not even going to pay attention to the handwriting. I'm not going to think about whose handwriting that might have been. And I put the put it in the bin, so I had no idea who it was from. Oh, see, I, I gave up this year. I was just like, they're going to know. I fully put my name and everything on it, even though I posted it myself. I was just like, yeah. because I'm the only person in the state, like there's not even like any guesswork involved. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think dad left it on the table when he left it with my address side up. And I'm like, just just cut it open. Just take yeah. it out. <laughs> well hold done. that in half and go and put it in the bin straight away. <laughs> well done. Very, very good. Um. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth, there's someone else who's been talking about how pretty their book was tonight and perhaps maybe that might have been me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <Well. laughs> I will say no more, but I will <laughs> head off. So good night, everyone. Night, All Elizabeth. Right. Night, Elizabeth.
you're probably going to hear my fan more often now because I just back there was like, I am so hot. I am stifling. Having the fan at the other side of the room is not enough. So it's, yeah. If it's getting too loud, let me know. No, you're fine. No worries at all. So did we have anything more to add? I guess it's hard because we can't really discuss our book, the books as general. Does anyone have anything else to add or any questions to ask, I suppose? Oh, sorry, I'm taking your job, Naomi. That is absolutely fine. <laughs> I would it probably... wasn't even supposed to be my job. It was supposed to be Karina's job. And it was a <laughs> you didn't want it. Okay. Um, I would probably say I've decided that I'm going to take off digital books as an option because I think that if we do do we end up doing this again, it was my major stumbling block for getting anywhere with the book because I can't do audio books unless I'm under certain circumstances. And yeah. so I think I'm going to take them off as an option for um, Secret Santa. For yourself? Yeah. yeah, just for myself. I mean, obviously yeah. anybody else can do it who wants yeah. it. Because certain people, like, it's a preference because they do do better that way. But yeah. my problem is, is that I don't like getting e-books and you can't really do it anyway. And audio books are... Um, a very specific purpose for me. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciated this because it forced me to start my book. Yeah. I yep. have so many Secret Santa books. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll read that. And then I read yeah. whatever we're reading. Mm -hmm. So this was a nice push to actually get started and I will actually finish it. <laughs> and I think that's a good part of it too like I even though I've started this and I know that I probably won't get back to it for a couple of weeks until I'm like in a car driving the fact that I've started means that I will go back to it um, yeah it'll be the first when once you get in the car it's going to be what you put on exactly yeah. that yeah because it, I've already started so as well and truly will be my first pick even it's though I've got about so six funny because I just do not listen to audiobooks in the car it's about the only place I will, I, I will, after I've gotten into a book, if I'm really into it, I'll start listening to it in other ways. But generally speaking, I have to be past the halfway mark and truly, truly into it for that to work. Otherwise, it's the best place yeah. for me to listen to them. I barely listen to music in the car anymore. Mm. I don't the only thing I can like listen either. to in the car is like a podcast or music. It has to be really self-contained and it has to be quite interesting. Otherwise, I just drift out, which happens all the time when I'm. I'm the reverse problem. What was that? I have the opposite problem of I start to focus on the book instead of the road. <laughs> it's all bad. That's why I can't listen to audio books. Well, for me, like it's a big part of why I stay awake when I'm driving. Like when I listen to music is when I start to get drowsy because. I, if I stop engaging because I know the music well, I'm not really like awake, whereas a book keeps me alert because I want to follow the story. But I, I will admit I don't use it for city driving, I use it for country driving. So. And you also don't really listen to the kind of music that Karina listens to, so there's all for that. <laughs> I, I was I, like, there's no sleeping to my music. No. <laughs> <laughs> you all heard my phone go off. <laughs> Oh, dear. Does anybody else want to know their secret Santa people while I've got the list open? I know who my secret Santa was because Santa. her name was on the outside of the package. So, <laughs> so you were like good like Kim, huh? <laughs> no, it was Bobby this year. Hmm. All I really knew before you told me, Naomi, was I think at the back it said Red Bank went, it's either one, one or two people, right? <laughs> Yeah. It should have said uh, Upper Mount uh, Upper Mount Gravatt. <laughs> was it, it would have been Queensland? Oh, Red I Bank think it was just Queensland. I'm thinking Red Bank was last time where you used to live. I don't no, know. Red Bank is Matt and Preston. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's. That's, yeah, that's their I place. looked at so many addresses during the Secret Santa. I don't yeah. know. Oh, and it was Queensland. It all, it all just flowed together. I'm like, I, I don't know where anyone lives anymore. You all, it's all just like yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, unless anyone has anything to add, this will be a shorty but a goodie today. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we hope to see you next time. What are we reading next month, Miss Mel? We are reading The House of Shattered Wings by Elliot de Baldard. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Elizabeth's pick. Do we have that yet? We do not have that yet. Okay. I have it, but it's upstairs, so I can't show it. I got it from the library. French author, guys. We're reading a French author. How exciting. Oh. Give our thumbs. 
<laughs> I've heard good things about her. I haven't, but never read anything by her. Yeah, I've actually got like a, I haven't actually read anything by her, but I have framed one of her book covers because it's so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so I have intentions to read her, obviously. <laughs> All right, I'm going to close this off, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye. Good night. Bye. Oh.